for joy. So forget the compromise. At Home Goods, you can spend less and find more to level up your holiday cheer. Because your favorite things about this season don't cost a fortune. They're found. For muscle cramps and spasms, TheraWorks Relief works fast. So get back at it. TheraWorks works. For fast muscle relief, TheraWorks works. Available in stores everywhere. Monday on ET, we're with new mama Rihanna. Seeing his morning face, I cherish that. Riri talks motherhood, new music, and Super Bowl. We are so excited for this. I can't believe I even said yes. Listen, thanks to Noah for uh, joining my handsome man's club oh. today Whoa. out here. <laughs> NCIS Hawaii airs Monday nights on CBS. The island air has gotten to his head. It's happening now. Most of us dry this Friday evening. However, there is one part of our area that has slightly higher odds of seeing showers and thunderstorms. I'm going to talk about that and the noticeable changes for the weekend in just a bit. The fallout continues today after former Spurs guard Josh Primo is accused of indecent exposure. Coming up, we'll tell you how the Bear County Sheriff's Office is now getting involved in the case. We are live at 5 right here at Coma Lander Stadium to bring you the big game and our big game coverage number 5 Brandeis against number 7 Reagan to decide who wins the district title in 28-6A. The News at 5 starts right now. First at five, new developments in the Josh Primo case, and it involves a potential criminal investigation. The former Spurs guard suddenly cut from the team a week ago today and since then has been accused of exposing himself several times to a former Spurs employee. RJ Marquez is live at the AT&T Center where the Spurs will hit the court for the first time since a lawsuit was filed in this case. RJ. Yeah, that's right, Stephen Ursula. We are actually in the media room getting ready for Greg Popovich's pregame media availability in just a few minutes. But going back to this investigation by the Barry County Sheriff's Office, this is a preliminary investigation against Josh Primo, and this comes just 24 after 24 hours after we learned that Dr. Hillary Cowthen, a former Spurs sports psychologist, has accused Josh Primo of exposing himself to her multiple times and filed a lawsuit in this case, naming him as a defendant and the Spurs as well. So the Sheriff's Office says they are in contact with the alleged victim in this case, but did not specify if that was Dr. Cowthen or give us any more details about their early findings. Primo is accused of indecent exposure, but has not been hit with any criminal charges. Houston attorney Tony Busby filed the lawsuit, again, naming Primo and the Spurs organization as the defendants in this case. The suit claims that Primo exposed himself to Cowthen a total of nine times, dating back to December. Busby says the Spurs covered up his actions for months. Today's news was something Busby said he had hoped would come from yesterday's press conference. There will be a criminal complaint filed for multiple counts of indecent exposure against Mr. Primo, and we expect the, pro the authorities to prosecute. We expect them to prosecute. To the extent she is able to as a licensed professional, Dr. Cawthon will participate in those proceedings. So we reached out to Sheriff Javier Salazar about this, but we were told that he was not available for any further comments. So we're waiting to hear from the sheriff on this case here. The Spurs have said that they disagree with the accuracy of the facts, details, and timeline in that lawsuit and will let the legal process play out. Stephen Ursula. RJ, before you go, another question that was brought up after this press conference was how many people knew about these claims and for how long has any of that been cleared up? Well, there was a detailed timeline in the lawsuit, but again, the big question, Steve, was whether uh, Greg Popovich, head coach Greg Popovich, was aware of these claims. And tonight, again, this could be the first time we hear from Pop about this specific uh, press conference or the lawsuit. Again, the lawsuit claims that Dr. Cowthon specifically asked for Coach Pop to be made aware of uh, or be informed of these claims, but uh, she and neither Tony Busby said that they were not clear if that would ever happened. And uh, he's now speaking for the first time uh, later today in just a little bit, but we do not know if he will address this at all. I'm sure that there will be definitely some questions as there's still a lot of things that need to be cleared up when it comes to this case. But uh, that's what the latest we have here from the AT&T Center. Back to you guys. Thank you, RJ. We'll stay on top of that story. So did the minutes waiting for help at Robb Elementary take lives? Could more people have been saved? These questions may soon get some answers with a new Texas Rangers investigation. The Rangers now working with a doctor out of Austin trying to determine whether any of the 21 gunshot victims could have survived their injuries. 
had help come sooner. According to the Texas Tribune, four victims, teacher Eva Morales and three students, Jackie Casares, Jose Flores, and Javier Lopez, all had heartbeats when they were taken out of those classrooms on that fateful day. In an interview last month, the medical examiner on duty in Uvalde believes that they could have survived if first responders didn't wait more than 70 minutes to go inside the classroom. Well, now a Texas doctor is going to take a look at all 21 autopsies and see if that is true. This could take months. It's not clear how much this finding will impact the state's criminal investigation that's underway. Americans now four days away from casting the final votes in the crucial midterm elections that will determine the balance of power on Capitol Hill. As key Senate races tighten up, the campaign trail is only heating up. President Biden saying everything is at stake in these races, while at the same time, former President Donald Trump hinting that he's going to make a third run for the White House. ABC's Justin Finch has a look at how some states are making sure voters feel safe enough to hit the polls. In a closing case to voters in California and New Mexico, President Biden declaring democracy is on the midterm ballot. There's too much political violence. There's too much intimidation. That risk of politically motivated violence is top of mind for many Americans, according to new polling from ABC News and The Washington Post. That polling finds 88 percent of adults are concerned that the nation is at an increased risk of political violence with political divisions so starkly split. The poll comes one week after a man allegedly looking for House Speaker Nancy Pelosi broke into her California home and brutally bludgeoned her husband with a hammer. New York Governor Kathy Hochul telling CNN she's concerned about the spread of radical ideas. Every single elected official needs to call this out and condemn this violence. The nation's poll workers are already facing threats as well. Philadelphia's district attorney warning of consequences. Extremists of any type who are pondering, interfering in any way with a free, fair and final election better be warned. We have handcuffs, we have jail cells and we have Philadelphia juries that will be here. And going into the final weekend of the campaign that could decide which party controls the Senate, three presidents will stump in Pennsylvania, Obama, Biden and Trump. And former President Trump faces a November 14th deadline to testify before the House committee investigating the January 6th Capitol attack. The same day that sources with direct knowledge tell ABC News he could announce his 2024 presidential campaign. Justin Finch, ABC News, Washington. By the way, today, the last day to vote early in the midterm elections. Polls are open until 8 o'clock tonight here in Bear County. There are 51 locations throughout the county. We have a full list on KSAT.com. Now, if you don't get your ballot in by today, you have to wait until Election Day to vote November 8th. Looking outside with your traffic authority. It is Friday afternoon and we're looking at 410 at Callahan where the sun is shining brightly on a bunch of cars headed home for the weekend. And you can see there is a number of backups on I-10 here at Hackberry. You can see all the outbound traffic just filled up. All those lanes filled up. The bottom level here at I-35, pretty open. Top side, not so much. Good amount of sunshine out there right now. A narrow window of opportunity for a few storms to develop, but most of it's going to be east of San Antonio. Actually, just about all of it should be. Let's take a look at the radar right now. Nothing out there, nothing to worry about. Those of you farther east of San Antonio, I'll show you the future cast in just a moment, but you see just north of Gonzales, one little streamer shower that's about to cross over I-10. That's a pretty short lived shower. Here's a look at our future cast, and I like this high res model. I'm in complete agreement with it by 7 p.m. Notice a few showers and thunderstorms developing in a narrow line east of town, closer to Seguin, and then heading into Gonzales. Gonzales County by 7, 8 o'clock, then 9, 10, 11 p.m. Gonzales to Hallettsville, Cuero area. Again, this is east of San Antonio where they do develop east of town. We can't rule out a brief severe thunderstorm. There is that potential with the straight line gusty wind. So bottom line around San Antonio, we're really expecting it to remain dry this evening. The storms east of town, but gusty and noticeably lower humidity by 8 p.m. All right, we're going to talk more about this and the changes this cold front brings for the weekend. Coming right up, Ursula.
like here in that low humidity part of it. Breathing machines, ventilators, inhalers, hospitals. No, it isn't a resurgence of COVID, but another respiratory illness that is hitting children very hard. ABC's Alex Stone with a new growing health emergency and why the approach to the cure is changing. At children's hospitals nationwide, the flow of children who are struggling to breathe is growing rapidly. One part of California declaring a state of emergency. We're seeing the younger kids requiring admission to the hospital. RSV cases hitting a two-year high, twice as many cases as this time last year. We've seen about a 500% increase in positive testing in children that, that have been admitted for a respiratory infection. It's not COVID, but it could be a result of the pandemic. Doctors believe so many children were protected from getting RSV during social distancing and masking that now many are getting it all at once and at older ages because they didn't get it when they were younger during stay-at-home measures. In Michigan, a six-year-old boy has died from RSV. Very, very few children die from, from RSV. And the kids that, that get that sick, it's usually uh, a child who had an underlying illness. This week, our Ariel Reshef was inside the pediatric unit at Cohen Children's Medical Center in New York, which is working over capacity. When a child comes in with one of these respiratory illnesses, what's the course of treatment? We're giving a lot of support that often requires inhalation therapies, sometimes steroids, sometimes breathing machines like ventilators until the virus itself works its way out. Three-year-old Ella has been there since Sunday on a ventilator to help her breathe. How are you coping with this? Um, as you can see, I'm trying the best. I'm trying to keep high spirit for her. And today, Ella is making progress. She is off of the BiPAP. In Europe, a possible breakthrough. A monoclonal antibody injection has been approved that could protect newborns from getting RSV. We don't think that this is going to stop all infection from RSV. What this is really designed to do is stop RSV from being a serious disease and really causing those severe lung infections. That treatment is not yet approved in the U.S., but it could get approval here next year. Alex Stone, ABC News, Los Angeles. And we'll have more on the local surge of RSV cases coming up during the six o'clock news. Now to fire safety. Your home may be where you feel safest, but when it comes to fire, it's actually the most dangerous. Before you get out the space heater or cook the turkey, 12 on your sides, Marilyn Moore, it shows us what to do and what not to do to be fire safe. These sounds are proven to save lives. Working smoke detectors should be on every floor and in every sleeping space. The room where most home fires start, the kitchen. Cooking remains the leading cause of home fire and injuries, and it can be as easy as walking away from the stove and forgetting. Stand by your pan is a simple rule. But if you have a fire in a pan, fire experts say cut off the heat source and put a lid on the pan. If you don't have a lid, grab a cookie sheet and slide it on top. But never put water on a grease fire. For oven fires, keep the oven door closed. Turn it off and wait for the fire to go out. Have a fire extinguisher handy too. Cooler weather outside means more fire risk inside from burning candles, fireplaces with dirty chimneys, and space heaters. The vast majority of home heating deaths last year were the result of portable or stationary space heaters. We recommend looking for a model that turns off automatically if it gets too hot and which has a tip over switch. Place them at least three feet away from furniture or curtains and don't use extension cords or leave them on while you sleep. Outside, fire pits can be risky, especially in drier weather. Be sure to have an extinguisher and garden hose ready. And finally, no fires can get out of control quickly. So have a family escape plan before you need it. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. The powerful jackpot, Powerball jackpot, hitting an all-time high. And for most people, winning is a far-fetched dream. But it turned into a reality for one man. We're going to show you a former gas station clerk on how it changed his life back in 1999. Coming up on the News at 6, more than a dozen pets found infested with fleas and without food or water. Investigators say they were able to rescue some of them. The plan they're forming to help get the rest in what's being described as a hoarding situation. Look at this. And one San Antonio councilman left his colleague in tears. Now the consequences he faces could include a censure or no confidence vote. But what is that? What would it mean? City Hall reporter Garrett Berger tries to find some answers. 
Ah, it's that time again where most people have Powerball fever. You bought your ticket? No. Yeah. Let's neither. have till Saturday. True. All right. It is not the world's largest jackpot ever, but $1.6 billion might be pretty nice to have. Yeah. The last world record was $1.58 billion, also set by Powerball back in 2016. The jackpot has been growing for three months. The jackpot, the result of 39 drawings with no winner. The intensity seems to be increasing with each one. Got a huge participation from, you know, a large percentage of the U.S. population once the jackpot gets really big. And that's what drives these big increases. By the way, the next drawing Saturday, if someone wins, they can choose to get the entire sum of money in gradual payments over 29 years or a lump sum payment of more than $782 million. It may seem like a dream, but became a reality for Timothy Schultz back in 1999. One minute I was working for a little over minimum wage at a gas station and, you know, almost instantly just from a lottery ticket, I didn't have to do that anymore. And I was arguably, you know, sort of <laughs> retired. Yeah, he's living the dream. So what are the odds of winning like him? One in 292 million. So you're saying there's a chance? Not really. Not really. <laughs> yeah, one in 292 not so million, don't not think, the best odds you can get. Don't All right. think about the math. I'm thinking our odds of rain are a lot higher than that, you know, Ooh. in the next week or so, maybe? Uh, well, sprinkles and morning drizzle yeah. and fog, yeah, but not so much this weekend. And, of course, we've been talking about the potential for thunderstorms this afternoon and evening. And really around town, I wouldn't count on anything developing. Main headline here, storms east of San Antonio this evening and tonight. Bottom line for us around town and surrounding communities, we're talking a windy evening, gusts up to 35 miles per hour and the humidity falling off pretty quickly. And that's gonna lead to a fall like weekend. It was rather spring like all week long with the mugginess, the morning fog, dampness, but this weekend's gonna be very fall like just for two days. All right, let's take a look at the radar. And we talked about this earlier, really nothing out there. Just one little shower far east of San Antonio. This is a streamer shower within the south flow off the Gulf of Mexico, north of Gonzales, crossing over I-10 between Harwood and Walder. That's all we have out there right now. Here's the big picture, and most of the action is off to the north of us. We're going to be right on the tail end of it for locations east of San Antonio. Tornado warnings, actually several tornado warnings in parts of east and northeast Texas right now. This red polygon, that box indicating the tornado watch and even some severe thunderstorm warnings. That's where the real dynamics are right now, and that's where the main action is developing. And on the cold side of it, on the back side of this system, that blue, yeah, that's snow falling in the panhandle right now. Amarillo and Northward, they've got some snow here in town. We don't have much to talk about, just a thin line of clouds moving in right now with the cold front. Here's our future cast. I know I showed it to you before. I'm gonna show it to you again in case you missed it. Seven o'clock, a thin line of brief storms developing east of San Antonio, maybe even in Guadalupe County around Seguin. 8 o'clock starting to push eastward with the potential of some building uh, of it building southward a little bit closer to Floresville and Poth. 9 o'clock, it's far east of town, Gonzales, Hallettsville, Cuero area from 9, 10, 11 p.m. tonight. And this is actually the zone where we could have some brief severe thunderstorms with straight line winds being the primary threat. There's the off chance that we could have a severe storm or two. So, of course, we're going to keep close eye on it. I'll be here all evening and when necessary, if things just start developing, even just east of town, I'll be hopping live on the KSAT Weather Authority app to keep you updated. You want to see the cold front? Pretty easy to spot it here on the temperature map. Look at this. Amarillo 36. That's with the snow right now. Alpine at 58. You get to Del Rio 78. Meanwhile, Laredo 95. Yeah, hello cold front between those two locations right there. Cold front's going to keep moving through, and with it, it's going to sweep away the humidity quickly this evening. I think by 8 o'clock here in San Antonio, you're going to be sitting in the stands at the football game and notice that abrupt change in the mugginess. Dew points right now in the 60s, but notice this drier air. Dew points in the 40s, that's behind the cold front. That's just a few hours away, and it's going to be making it here. And it's going to stick around for the weekend, a lack of humidity. So that's going to allow for cooler mornings, no fog for a change. We're not going to have that dampness in the morning over this weekend, and we'll just have a lot of sunshine. But by Monday, yeah, that humidity's back along with the morning fog and uh, drizzly dampness as well.
Tomorrow we start the day at 53. A refreshing start to your Saturday feeling like fall. Nothing but sunshine 77 for the high temperature light and variable wind Sunday. We pretty much repeat at 52 in the morning, but 84 in the afternoon and a bit of a breeze out of the south southeast and seven day forecast really doesn't show any good rain chances. Just that dampness starting up again every morning starting on Monday highs in the 80s next week. Thank you, Adam. One of the guys relieved that there's no rain tonight. Hopefully in our forecast, Greg Simmons. He joins us live now <laughs> for yeah, yeah. from Comalander Stadium where there's a big game there yeah. tonight, Greg. Yeah, this is huge. I mean, the district title actually on the line on the final week of the high school football regular season on the field right now. Brennan, I should say Brandeis, getting ready for their big showdown with Reagan later. Both of these teams undefeated in district. When we come back, we'll have a live preview for you. Also, when we come back, one win away for the Houston Astros and their second ever World Series title coming up. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome live to Coma Lander Stadium for the big game and our big game coverage tonight. Number five, Brandeis taking on number seven, Reagan. And this is for the district title in 28-6A. And get this, in the final weekend of the high school football regular season. All right, the Broncos are coming into this game tonight with an 8-1 and one overall record, 7-0 and one in district with their only loss of the season. Number two, Brennan, Broncos quarterback J.C. Evans, is a true dual threat. He's thrown for over 1,000 yards, eight touchdowns, has rushed for another 11 touchdowns with over 340 yards on the ground. Reagan Rattler is also coming in a nice game with a 7-0 record in district with their only losses to Smithson Valley in the KSAT Pixie and Classic 2022 and Round Rock in the first two non-district games. Tonight, they play for the title. We're feeling great. Um, you know, whoever wins this game wins a district championship, and we wouldn't want it any other way. These are the kind of games you, you know, dream about. You know, we got Reagan in front of us. They're a really good team. They're really big up front. Uh, but we're just going to focus on us, focus on Brandeis football, and hopefully we come out 1-0 at the end of the week. All right, kick, kick off tonight. We're here at Comalander, 7 p.m. at Heroes between Champion MacArthur. Clemens and Steele battle 3-0-9 at Linoff. San Marcos against East Central. Seguin Smith and Valley up at Rangers. Southwest and Southwest Legacy. Another rivalry game tonight. Rosa, Marshall, Connor and Holmes at Gus. Burbank, Lanier at Alamo. Pearsall, YMLA at SAISD. The Salsa Bowl between Memorial and Kennedy. As with Veterans at 7. Fredericksburg and Bernie. And how about St. Anthony against San Antonio Christian School at 7.30. And Houston St. Pius, Central Catholic. Our big game coverage road trip has Larry and photographer Eddie Latigo headed west with their first stop at the Honey Bowl in New Valley to catch the Coyotes hosting the Somerset Bulldogs. Then it's over to Sabanau to see if the Yellow Jackets can stay undefeated this season against Rock Springs. And finally pulling into Hondo to watch the Owls take on the Poteet Aggies. The Houston Astros are one win away from their second World Series title. They're taking a three-game to two lead over the Phillies last night with a three to two victory in game five in Philadelphia. Rookie Jeremy Pena came through with a one-run single and a home run. And starter Justin Verlander finally got a victory in a World Series game. Game six is tomorrow night in Houston. The Spurs host the Clippers tonight. We do have one forfeit tonight. Eagle Pass win will not play Southside tonight due to a forfeit. And don't forget to join us on the BGC app for all the live broadcasts of your favorite high school football teams, courtesy of Tech. Texas Sports Productions, and then on the night beat for all the highlights and final scores. Live from Comalander Stadium, Greg Simmons, KSAT 12 Sports. Thank you, Greg. And we'll be right back. Thank you so much for watching the News at 5. See you at 6.